Welcome to Music for the Revolution. I am Jim Jones, and we are doing an interview today with Public Watchdogs. And so, Charles, Nina, why don't you introduce yourselves, and then we'll get into talking about what Public Watchdogs is. Sure. I'm Charles Langley, the Executive Director of Public Watchdogs, and I've been a public advocate since 1996. My name's Nina Daviars. I'm a board member of Public Watchdogs and um, an active volunteer. I um, was at one point a, a reporter for McGraw-Hill during Three Mile Island, and that's how I got involved in the situation at San Onofre right now, but also uh, was a government reporter. And so, you know, our advocacy with regard to public uh, awareness of what public agencies are doing in the public's interest is of primary concern. So you got to read all the really boring stuff that nobody wanted to look at. Absolutely. <laughs> How the government was spending our money wow. in every case and on every level of federal, state, you know, down to the local government. And sometimes public aid, and I've worked for a public agency. I worked for the state of California for four years. And so <laughs> sometimes public agencies, you know, forget that the public is the, the one that's footing the bill for everything, and they have a right to know, and that's really our mantra, that the public has a right to know. You know, a lot of it is going through documents, and you know, they talked about Nader's raiders from mm. the tradition of Ralph Nader. They didn't raid anybody, they just went through documents, and some time ago I did a comic strip, actually, with a consumer advocate superhero, <laughs> and his superpower was he had super magno x-ray glasses that allowed him to read the fine printing contracts. <laughs> and that was the, you know. Nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of what we do is we tear through documents and we're looking for the gotchas. Yeah. And attend public meetings. You know, most people are working hard to support their families and, and the cost of living in California. And so they don't have time necessarily to go to public meetings or, you know, sometimes public meetings are not even held at a time that's convenient for working people. That's for sure. Yeah. So uh, how you guys both have obviously a lot of passion for what you're doing and a lot of concern. Um, how, how did Public Watchdogs as an organization come about? Well, it really started when I became a whistleblower at another nonprofit advocacy organization I worked for, and they terminated me. And, oh. and um, my complaints and concerns were legitimate, and I still wanted to get involved in public advocacy, particularly in the issue of San Onofre. Hmm. And that organization didn't want to touch it with a pair of tongs because they said it would upset the Public Utilities Commission. Hmm. A lot of nonprofits are dependent on something called intervener compensation from the California Public Utilities Commission. So, our model is to find a way to intervene at the commission without being dependent on intervener compensation. So, we're going out to our members and, and requesting funding, and to large donors requesting funding. But our first issue was San Onofre. That and, was the first one for public washouts. Yeah, it's really our primary issue right now. And the original bylaws, they've been tweaked a little bit, but the original bylaws were that Public Watchdogs was incorporated to protect the public from the California Public Utilities Commission. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty <laughs> serious mission statement. Uh, but it's an important one because, like you said, the being able to keep on top of what's going on with uh, the fine print on things that are happening for the public good, most normal humans can't keep up with that right. kind of thing. So it's good that we have somebody who's looking out for us that's looking at that. And, and think of that name, the California Public Utility Commission. You know, they have a responsibility to 
look out for the public's interest. And um, unfortunately, with the situation at San Onofre, we don't feel that that's necessarily being properly served all the time. Yes. And, and even if it is, the public doesn't necessarily have the time nor the access to those records to have a clear understanding of how they're being represented. Yeah. And, it, and they're paying for it. They're paying for it, not only the agency and everything that it does is being funded by the public, but as rate payers, they're paying through their utility bills. Yeah. So I think it was probably about a year ago when we first met, and this was at another organization, San Diego Water Protectors, mm-hmm. and uh, I remember when you guys came in, there was a, you were given a spot to give a kind of a brief overview of what was happening at San Onofre. And initially, actually it was just before you got there, somebody was handing out a flyer that was dealing with the topic that you guys were going to be talking about. And I was looking at it, and I'm like, this can't possibly be true. This is just sounds utterly unbelievable. And then when you guys showed up and started going through the details and showing the documentation, I was just blown away. And, and myself, like almost everybody I've talked to since, seems like they have no idea. Right. And, um, you know, for Music for the Revolution, part of our um, mission for being uh, an organization is to use the benefit of music to help bring people together in a non-confrontational way because there's just so much yelling and fighting with each other right now. Nobody's hearing each other, right? So using that music to create this positive environment where people can come together and then connect them with people who are working on important issues. And so we got very excited about what you guys were doing because we thought it was hugely important. And, um, you know, we put together a couple of town hall meetings to help get the word out. What was your experience with the town hall meetings? Well, we're really grateful to Music for the Revolution yes. because we got some wonderful donors out of those experiences of making the presentations. And we also got to participate in the, the Music for the Revolution Festival, yes. which was an awesome musical event. And I would have to say that our relationship with Music for the Revolution has been completely transformative. We would not be here right now, today, in this this splendid studio if it wasn't for Music for the Revolution. Is that right? Well, yeah. there, there are so many people that were at some of those initial meetings that each, I mean, we, you know, at every meeting, at every presentation, we give an invitation, not only to for people to tell everybody that they know, but if there is another organization that they're involved in that would be happy to come make a presentation anytime, anywhere, that you know we're available to do so and increase the public's uh, awareness and so many people took us up on that invitation oh, okay. and so it led into many other presentations and um, that was our intent from the very beginning to help leverage you know this is very much that's what grassroots is isn't yeah. it yeah. yeah that's what yeah. grassroots is isn't it? Well, and it doesn't seem until more recently that we were getting anything in the news about it. And what we did get usually was <laughs> dismissing it as though it had already been solved, When it, and that was the furthest thing from the truth. So it was really important that organizations like yours, and specifically what you guys are doing, uh, exist and are able to provide that information in a digestible way for you know mere mortals to understand what's going on. Well, Yeah, you know, Hannah Arendt talked about something called the banality of Mm. evil. And what's happening at San Onofre is a great example of the banality of evil. Because once you acquaint yourself with the facts, it's truly terrifying. And, And what we discovered, Jim, is that when we notify people of the facts, they kind of shut down. They they become alarmed, they become fearful. And then they they get depressed and shut down, and that's where um, some of the techniques we've used from Music for the Revolution will start these things off with 
a local musician singing something kind of calming and we'll close it with something calming. And I think it's really made a difference in our public outreach because we've been able to um, take the terrifying nature of this message and make it a little more palatable. Mm. I information is, you know, knowledge is power. Yeah. And uh, there's an awful lot of information on our website. I'd invite your viewers to definitely check out our website at publicwatchdogsplural.org. Um, we have um, not only other board members that um, help to give us legal advice, and uh, you know we've pursued um, some legal avenues with regard to San Onofre. Um, but, you know, there's an awful lot of information that you're never going to see in the mainstream media. So for those who are just now hearing about there being some issue at San Onofre, if you were going to give the highlights, the bullet points of what the current concerns are, what are those? Well, first of all, most people do not, and myself included, I was in the same boat when I first met Charles, I, I said, oh, you know, Surely you jest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, I was uh, living in Pittsburgh uh, during Three Mile Island in 1979, and so it is one of the reasons that when I heard the facts, I became passionate. This is not something I could ever walk away from after being informed of what's going on. But, you know, most people are completely unaware that it was a radiation leak at San Onofre that shut the plant down so abruptly. But we all know that we're living in an earthquake zone, and, and San Onofre was built on an earthquake fault in a tsunami zone in the mil middle of millions of people. So everything that we're talking about with regard to the burial of 3.6 million pounds of radioactive nuclear waste is in that environment mm -hmm. and they're using our money and doing it on the cheap and so if you go onto our website you'll find for example that they're burying this in cans that are five eighths of an inch stainless steel and with no monitoring system underground those are just the high notes but you know again they're using the public's money to bury this 108 feet from the pacific ocean on the cheap so thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members. I'm speaking on San Onofre, and um, specifically, I'm speaking and presenting myself on behalf of a number of children. This past weekend, we had the Music for the Revolution Festival in Fallbrook, California. Had hundreds and hundreds of participants there, amazing musicians. And the kids that were attending the event wanted to have their voices heard. Now, before I say anything to the effect of where you know, they're political or anything like that, I want you to know that we allow the children to be children and just allow them to remind us what is really important. Now, as I was going through, these are actually all the cards that the kids made you, and they made them out of re recycled materials. And as I was going through these cards, I realized something. And you actually have a lot in common with these kids because they were utilizing words such as protect, conserve, environment, and in other words, such as please hear us. So this is my high level understanding of what's going on, and let me know if this is correct, because this is what stands out to me uh, as far as the concerns. Definitely that it's right near the coast uh, in terms of the water with the potential for rising water levels. Mm -hmm. um, but that the containers that they're wanting to put them in uh, initially were approved because they thought that this was going to be a temporary stay and that everything was going to get shipped off maybe to Nevada or somewhere else when it was approved by the Coastal Commission. And so the canisters that they're using are only warrantied if we include the structure that they're sitting in for 10 years. That's correct. And, yeah. and if that's the case, and we're talking about something that's lethal for you know 250000 and like you said, that's not being monitored, well, there's just a recipe for disaster here. Um, and so it seems to me that <laughs> somebody's got to exactly what you guys are doing, raise the flag and say, wait a minute, this doesn't add up. How are we going to deal with this? Well, actually, you know, Edison knew better because they have sued the Department of Energy. It is a multifaceted problem that we have, and it is one of national consequence, and that's something that I'd like to talk about very briefly, that, you know, if Edison gets away with doing this on one of the most pristine beaches in 
the country uh, in the circumstances that we previously described on an earthquake fault, etc. It's going to set a national precedent. They're going to do this anywhere that they want. We have 104 of these uh, around the country, and I think there's 12 or 14 that, like San Onofre, are in the uh, decommissioning phase. We're talking about 104 plants that are going to be Nuclear plants, yeah. right. And so there's a dozen or 14 that, are like San Onofre, are either closed down or closing down. I mean, the industry, the nuclear industry itself is you know, pretty much going belly up. Um, and so whatever precedent is set here on our coast, this is not just a little local regional problem. Right. This is going to set a national precedent. And so, you know, the entire country really needs to listen up because whatever they get away with doing here, they're going to get away with doing anywhere in the country. And we're talking about nuclear waste on water tables in communities and then, of course, the risk of uh, any kind of a crack or an accident would be critical. It could taint the entire Pacific Ocean. Oh, yeah. And so, it, you know, Somerset Mound referred to Ireland as a place of beauty, strange and terrible. And if you go to San Onofre at dawn or at dusk, this is a place of beauty, strange and terrible. It is magical. There is an, uh, a kind of infinite feeling of boundlessness that you get when you look out across the Pacific Ocean and look back to the cliffs. This is a sacred space that needs to be protected, and we've made it our primary mission at this time to try and protect it. Wow. And, and it is a prime example of the mission of public watchdogs. Because, again, you know, Edison was able to successfully sue the Department of Energy for not providing a national repository. And so, you know, uh, the bigger picture is that it's indicative of the either inactivity or non-representation of public agencies on behalf of the public's interest. Mm. And that's really kind of the crux of who we are. And so, you know, this, this situation of not having a national repository for something so lethal to human life, to all life, this is a can that's been kicked down the road since the Eisenhower administration. We've paid the Department of Energy over $40.2 billion to not do its job, and that's not yeah. acceptable. Yeah. Well... Uh, I've been hearing a lot in the news about some new opportunities that are showing up again. There's talk about uh, Nevada with Yucca Mountain opening up again or possibly something in New Mexico or Texas. Um, are any of these viable options or what's almost, going on? Almost anything that they try to create is going to be bound up with you know, hundreds of years of litigation because people just do not want nuclear waste moving across state lines. So in terms of getting the waste away from the beach, and that beach may not even be there in 50 years from erosion, in terms of doing that, we need to find a place within California. Hmm. Um, one of the th ideas that we like is simply moving it across the freeway where it's 150 feet above sea level. Right now, the, the bottoms of these, these cans um, are actually below the water level. They're very close. They're very mm -hmm. close to the water level. And one of your board members, Tom English, has done some wonderful research into that and into sea level rise. And he says that within 35 years, the bottoms of these cans will be penetrated with water. Water will be surrounding them, and it will be like a slow-moving washing machine going in and out. It's mm -hmm. an extraordinarily dangerous situation. But whether it's San Onofre or, you know, obviously we're living in an era of technological advancement. I mean, just recently we're experiencing, you know, data, private data um, being shared in an unauthorized yeah. manner. And, um, you know, so those types of concerns where you have public agencies that are regulating communications and... Um, you know, monopolies and things like that. You know, Public Watchdogs is about taking action in a legal forum in order to rep have the public's interest represented in some manner. 
And um, so the legal aspect of what we're doing in terms of action and that being supported by our members and our donors is something that is, you know, very proactive. It's just one way that we can hold their feet to the fire. Yeah. Well, I am so very grateful that you guys are doing what you're doing. And I think everybody in California owes you a great debt of, <laughs> of gratitude because it is something that impacts all of us. And like you said, there's like 8.5 million people just within 50-mile radius. Is that right? Yes. Of San Onofre, yes. right? That's like right in the middle of where the concern is. Well, think about these numbers. In Orange County, you know, Disneyland, Knott's Berry Farm, and all the attractions, they're latest statistics are about 49 plus almost 50 million people that come into Orange County on an annual basis in one year to Orange County. San Diego is not too far behind. Hmm. So if you round those numbers up, you're talking about 100 million people just between the two counties. And of course, Los Angeles, you know, is even more with the studios. And so these people are coming in completely unaware and vulnerable to what we're discussing here. Right, right. Well, and it's something that, like you said, affects everybody. There's nobody that would not be affected. And uh, whether we're talking about, you know, important corridors of transportation for the whole country coming up from Mexico, uh, the ocean, I mean, it is just huge. What is it that you would say that people can do if they are concerned about this issue and want to get involved? Ask their elected officials. It doesn't matter which party because, Mm -hmm. you know, radiation, nuclear radiation is Mm non-discriminatory in its its damage to age, sex, race. It doesn't matter. Political party, it doesn't matter. We're a nonprofit organization, and so... The questions that we're asking are with regard to the public's interest, and that's everybody. Yeah. And and so I would say pick up the phone and ask your elected officials, why are they not talking about this issue? And try to get an answer. And And can I jump in there? Please. If you get online, go to publicwatchdogs.org, take a a look at our petition and sign it. You'll, You'll actually get on our list. We very rarely email it. We've, we've only emailed our list four times in the last 18 months, so you're not going to get spam, but it's a way of staying in touch and keeping in touch with what's going on around this issue. Great, great. And we will have your website and information about your company in the notes for the video, uh, so they'll be in the notes below if you'd like to click on those links to follow through to their website. We are a nonprofit, not a company. I'm sorry. That's okay. Yes, we're, we're, we're a 501c3. We're a 501c3. <laughs> yes, let's be clear about yeah. that. Um, so one of the things that was interesting at our festival is we had a couple of bands that actually um, wrote songs about San Onofre to nice. be performed at the event. And one of them, we actually had somebody with a video camera who recorded it. And this was uh, with the um, San Onofre Blues I don't know if you yeah, remember that one. Oh, Bill Weigel. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so so uh, we'll probably close out this video with that and uh, have that as our closing credits because I thought that was a lot of fun. Fantastic. But um, we have definitely, um, again, appreciate what you guys are doing and have really enjoyed our time working on, with you on projects, with, whether it's the town hall stuff or working and collaborating on the festival ideas. Um, I just uh, really have have come to appreciate our relationship. Well, you know, those town halls that you helped orchestrate for us um, resulted in us actually doing a total of 176 other town halls in the last wow. year. It was very successful, mm-hmm. and especially uh, the format that you came up with was instrumental with, with uh, Music for the Revolution, and it's open doors that we didn't really know existed. So. I'd have to say our our relationship with Music for the Revolution and its support of the community and the advocacy community has been extraordinary, and we're very grateful for all your help. Mm -hmm. Definitely, Jim. Love you guys. So uh, thank you again for everything, and um, I really hope that we get this out to a lot of people because people have a right to know. (laughs) Thanks, guys. Thank you, Jim.
million pounds of toxic nuclear waste. 